Vanakkam, good evening, namaste. Thank you all for joining. We will be beginning in a couple of minutes as soon as we are live on Facebook. Uh, Mr. Sudarshan, yes, once sir. I finish my talk for 20 minutes, then I have no no, no for there are no question answers, etc. at the end, right? Uh, no such, sir. No such in this. When you take your April session, then yeah. you're Kripa ma'am, are we live on Facebook? Yes. Good evening, Vanakkam, Namaste to all of you who have joined us for the virtual inaugural information session of the annual Mark U Public Policy Fellowship Program organized and run by DAV Group of Schools Chennai as well as Tamil Nadu Young Thinkers Forum. At the outset, we would like to wish all our viewers on Facebook and here a very, very happy Republic Day. We will begin this evening's proceedings with an invocation. May I request two fabulous teachers, one being principal, Mrs. Nandini, principal, DAV Metric Higher Secondary School, Gilnagar, and Mr. Guha Prasad, music teacher, DAV Group of Schools, to begin this evening with an invocation. Over to both of you.
thank you so much uh, guha prasad sir as well as nandini ma'am at the outset i'd like to welcome our distinguished guests mr arvind dattar senior advocate supreme court of india dr shobha vartaman eminent social commentator activist volunteer doctors without borders the young and dynamic mr vikas arya the secretary of the governing board of dav group of schools as well as all the participants who are here for this session i will begin this evening by briefly walking virtually walking through the contours of the public policy fellowship program as well as the online media studies program that we are launching please give me a moment i trust all of you are able to see the screen yes yes it's visible sudarshan ji thank you so much so as mentioned this is the annual public policy fellowship program by dav shikshanam and tamil nadu young thinkers forum we are indebted to the arya samaj charitable foundation chennai for hosting this last year was the first initiative this year we have decided to go ahead by adhering to all covid-19 guidelines by hosting this program on site the initial brainstorming for this program started almost one and a half to two years ago with mr vikas arya leading it some of the objectives that we thought we must keep in mind while conceiving or curating such programs was the following to enhance and cultivate thinking on some of india's key public policies the context to this remain three tier one is global historical and contemporary importantly uh, we felt the need to sensitize and raise awareness amongst common minds another latest lateral entry idea was that we should begin to satellite into key areas of focus as deep dive or mini courses into specific studies this feedback came to us from last year into defense into media into religion into political so on and so forth these are just to give you a precursor to last year these were our launch posters it was befittingly launched the same date last year by air marshal s vartaman as you can see on the screen we had several members from the government of tamil nadu retired senior bureaucrats professionals who are ably leading some of their organizations today who led this public policy fellowship program uh, by being our faculty members we had 50 best minds from the city of chennai and some even traveled from other districts of tamil nadu to participate in this 3 month long 10 sunday public policy fellowship program so what do we do at this program we have 10 modules as you can see economic development foreign policy defense and security technology judiciary politics governance education health and media these 10 modules are divided into 20 sessions or perhaps even one session per module some of the sessions that we will be covering as part of the public policy fellowship program main course are as follows we will uh, look to understand what is today's global military might in the second session we also want to look at what it is to compare it with indian military might uh, tamil nadu state elections are up upcoming so we look to forecast and analyze what it means one nation one election is uh, buzzing around the corner so we'll take we'll see if we can take an objective overview aadhar uh, we we'll, tamil nadu is the first state to have an artificial intelligence policy so we have a very very able ias officer who's going to steer artificial intelligence and governance uh, we are going to bring to you a policy perspective on the goods and services tax 
COVID-19, which is on all our minds at the moment, perhaps nearing the end, we look at India's response. Uh, DAB, since it is hosting it, we cannot miss out on education. So education, a key catalyst to public policy. We are going to look at what it means to understand governance structures in the city. Uh, we are grateful to Arvind sir for suggesting the next topic, which is reforms in judiciary as a two-part lecture. Uh, we are going to look at agriculture reforms, uh, federalism, what is the role of media, uh, high octane US presidential elections has just concluded. Till yesterday, we have, we have uh, fissures in the border. So we're going to take stock of India-China relations. And we're going to look at aspects such as what it means to financialize societies as a mean to social justice. And of course, last but not the least, internal security. What are the key specifics? As mentioned, the governing board and organizers have taken an informed decision that we will have the format as an on-site in-person initiative. We may restrict the number of registrations by adhering to the COVID-19 guidelines. Uh, the course will start as such on February 7th, conclude on April 11th, 10 Sundays. There will be 20 sessions for each 75 minutes. Uh, in order to enable the academic rigor of the course, there will be assessments and there'll be a certificate on completion. We also have a token registration fee in order to ensure that all our participants are committed to the course. As you can see, it is rupees 2,500. And we have a performer where we request all our participants to fill up and then the organizing committee will revert to them on the confirmation or regret of registration. One interesting satellite mini course that we are launching uh, together with the main course is the Public Policy Fellowship Program Media Studies. This is a eight session online course. This course is designed to enable a comprehensive understanding of media studies and the dynamics of Indian media, its future objectively. Some of the sessions we, which we will be covering in this include media censorship and propaganda, what is the future of journalism? There is a dynamic emergence of new media, which, in, which is in both mainstream as well as OTT platforms. We are going to have a session on comparative studies between Indian media vis-a-vis -vis global media, what it means to have politics, ideology, and journalism. Are they devoid of each other? Or are they in sync with each other? Trial by media, there's been a historic example of such cases. What goes into it? Is it right? Is it wrong? Uh, we're also going to discuss history of contemporary media. Some of the key specifics of this course is also the same as our previous course, but it is an eight session course, uh, February 15th to 25th. Uh, evening 6.30 to 7.45 p.m. Uh, on the day the sessions are held, 75 minutes. But this will be a virtual format course where we will be doing it on Zoom. But we will be recording the session and DAV has a very sophisticated setup where we will ensure that these sessions are archived and uh, the participants are able to have a, have a ringside view to these sessions certificate on completion and we have a registration fee as well and this too is an assessment based course i'm going to stop here and we will be uh, 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 giving you a cursory look into what uh, who the faculties are uh, for this program but before that it's uh, uh, my privilege to invite our distinguished guests to speak we will start with Mr. Arvind P. Dattar, who is a senior advocate of the Madras High Court. He joined the bar in 1980. He set up his independent practice in 1984. Uh, he's practiced before various tax tribunals, company law board, high courts, and Supreme Court. He now mainly practices before the Supreme Court and has appeared in several important cases on taxation and constitutional law. 
He's written over 150 articles for various journals and newspapers. He's the co-author of The Courtroom Genius, written along with um, another eminent jurist, Soli Sorabji. Uh, he's also visiting, he has been a visiting faculty at the Institute of Chartered Accountants, Institute of Company Secretaries of India, Institute of Cost and Work Ac Accountants of India, Bharati Dasan, Institute of Management, Trichy, to name a few. Uh, he is a founder trustee of the Palkiwala Foundation Chennai and director of the Nani Palkiwala Arbitration Center Chennai. May I request you, sir, to uh, address this virtual gathering? Good evening to all of you. Can you hear me clearly? Is that clear enough? Absolutely. Yes. Good evening to all of you. Uh, Mr. Sudarshan, thank you for the kind introduction and giving us a very broad overview of the fellowship program. Uh, Mr. Arya, my friend Venkat Vardhan, DAV Shikshana, and the TN Young Thinkers Forum. Uh, first of all, uh, I must sincerely congratulate the organizers for arranging this fellowship program in 10 modules. And when I saw the content of the course, the eminent faculty, I realized that what a treasure it is for those people who will have the privilege of participating in this course. Apart from the very minor amount of two and a half thousand rupees, you have covered, in my view, all the issues which really form the bedrock of a government, of a country, of a democratic country. Uh, very often, I find that in daily life, uh, the uh, events of the day whether it's the suicide of a celebrity or whether if it's a cricket match or whether it is some kind of agitation in the capital, we get drowned by these events and there is very little time for focused thinking on key issues. Apart from these events, uh, we have many of us have very long working hours and by the time you come home in the evening, it's very, very difficult to set your mind to do something else. This program in my mind is very ideally uh, structured and curated because you get the opportunity of laser focused attention to specific subjects which are extremely important for a democratic society and especially for thinking members of society. Now, for example, you have taken the program of economic development. We keep talking of economic development, but very few of us have the chance to get into economic development, to be taught by professors of economics as to what is the meaning of development, what is the purpose of development. And we also must see that where is India going, where are we, we can all think and analyze the point. Uh, just to talk on economic development, as a lawyer, I would say, what is the importance of a tax policy in the governance of a country? Is, is the tax policy geared for promoting growth or is the policy geared toward just collection of revenue? If you just collect revenue, you may sacrifice growth. Is that's the kind of thinking which has to be understood. And I, I am sure your professors will tell you, if you see the uh, December issue of Fortune magazine, they have the global Fortune 500 ranking for 2020, for 2019 and 2020. What is startling, and I was absolutely stunned by that statistic, in 2003, China had just 11 companies in the Fortune 500 list, 11. In 2019, 2019, 2020, China has now 124 companies in the Fortune 500 list. For the first time, it has overtaken the United States. And the US has 121 con companies in the Fortune 500, global Fortune 500. China has 124. If you do the math, you'll find that these two countries have half the world's largest corporations. India is only seven. And our the largest Indian company is 96th in the entire list. Why is that? Right? So these are issues, I'm just giving an example where we can ponder about what is it that makes India a two and a half trillion economy and why has China become a 14 trillion economy? What have they done? What parts of, of course, we, they are not a democracy. There's a serious human right violation issues and so on and so forth. But at the same time, there are lessons to be learned. Why are businesses going to Vietnam? Why are businesses going to Thailand? For example, I just bought a blood pressure monitor the other day for my mother-in-law. It's made in Vietnam. Why can't, we, why can't it be made in India? 
I purchased a refrigerator. It's made in Thailand. Now, these are things which bother me. You know, why, why is the soil of India not favorable enough for these goods to be manufactured? The biggest market for blood pressures and refrigerators, apart from China, is India. And why is it not made? So what are the factors which will promote economic development? You've got a program on technology. We talk of artificial intelligence. How is it going to affect us? What is it going to have? What impact will it have on job creation? On the one hand, we want to create one to 25 million jobs. On the one hand, you have artificial intelligence. Is it going to take away jobs? Is it going to create new jobs? What is the skill development? So I must congratulate Mr. Sudarshan and your colleagues for bringing to awareness. You know, very often we just hear about artificial intelligence, but frankly, even as a, a lawyer, I must confess my ignorance of the subject. There is, and but when a person like me attends your course, I'll get a completely structured, detailed study of what is artificial intelligence, what it really means, and it's quite different from what the layperson thinks about it. Then take, for example, the judiciary. I was just giving the example of judiciary. The common complaint is there are judicial delays. It takes years to decide a case and so on. But that is, you see, very often what happens is, uh, like John F. Kennedy said, we have the freedom of thought, but we don't have the duty of thinking, right? So when you say there's judiciary slow, how do you make generalizations? You see, we the unfortunate part of one sad part is we tend to generalize. We say that all people of uh, who are doing X are bad. All people doing Y of this category, we just generalize. You say judiciary is slow, judiciary is taking time. But you'll be surprised to know that when I was working on some policy issues here, out of the areas of all the high courts, there are 25, 26 high courts in the country, 52% of areas are just in four courts. In many of the remaining courts, the areas are very, very minimal. Take Tamil Nadu, for example, Madras High Court has perhaps the least areas of criminal appeals. It's a staggeringly successful record of disposal of criminal cases, but nobody knows about it. You take the lower court, the magistrate courts, the district courts. Again, 54% of the areas are only in four states. In the remaining states, cases are being disposed of within two years, three years, and so on and so forth, but nobody knows about it. So when you talk of judiciary, we should understand what is the role of judiciary? What are the reasons for the delay? How do we uh, take about, uh, how do we what do we contribute to reducing the delay in our own small way? And one thing is, at least when you solve, when you when you understand the problem, then you will not come jump to general conclusions and make uh, and sort of make statements which are not validated by facts. You also, I also liked your course on media. Today, there is a huge issue of trial by media, and I had the opportunity of appearing for all the TV channels, the National Broadcasting Association, in this. Sushant Singh Rajput murder case. And they were, as you know, the sensational reports in the media, it's a murder, it is this, it is that. Now, on the one hand, you have the fundamental right to free speech. At the same time, there is an issue of privacy. You can ruin the reputation of, say, Mr. Sudarshan by publishing something on the media. And your, your reputation is damned. You are accused of the most ghastly crime. Who knows what happens if an apology is published after two weeks? Who cares? It doesn't really matter. Your damage is done. Now, how do you balance freedom of speech vis-a-vis -vis the uh, privacy of a person, the reputation of a person? How do you ensure that there is a fair trial? If, like the Arushi murder case, it was found that 74% of the Hindi channel time was focused only on this Arushi case. And ultimately, the do two doctors were uh, acquitted. But the entire media had gone on as if they are the culprits. They had come to a conclusion and so on and so forth. So your thing on media, again, is an important thing. There'll be a trial by media. What is the role? Now there are many judgments. The uh, people who speak on the subject will tell you that all the channels have asked for self-regulation. They don't want any statutory regulation. They said we'll self-regulate. Now if it's self-regulation, how do you monitor it? At what stage can you disclose the evidence of a crime? Suppose a dead body of a film star is found. How do you jump to conclusions? At what stage can the media comment on make conclusions? So these are all very interesting issues as far as media is concerned. And it's not a very simple thing. See, being a democracy has got its advantages, but it also has got serious problems. And we should make sure that the, and at the end of the day, I will not give up anything for the for being a citizen of a free, free country. I mean, what happening in other country, you may have economic progress, but it's at the cost of human rights. And I think the solution is that as Mr. Palkiwala put it, it is not a binary. It's not that you're either freedom or you don't have economic development. You can have both. And that's been demonstrated by so many countries. So your course, in my uh, opinion, is that it 
gives you a structured laser focused thinking of experts on teaching on all these uh, subjects and what is more important is it's every week so you get time to learn about a subject maybe the faculty can give you library courses or can give you a a, bibli a bibliography of connected articles which you can read now the world is your library thanks to the internet so everything is available on the net and you can access details suppose for example you just uh, study say for example political idea just to give you an example i just bought a book by tom but there's a person called tom butler bowden and he has got a 50 series he has summarized 50 political thinkers in four four pages each 50 philosophy 50 economic classics so i was just going through that book and i found astonishing uh, comments by john locke by montesquieu by other people i was surprised to know that this theory of separation of powers that a democracy must have a legislature an executive and a judiciary all should be separate in judiciary must be independent the legis parliament must function in its own way the executive must implement the laws this was thought of by montesquieu in 1748 and that was the foundation of the us uh, constitution so it is a fascinating thing for me to learn that how the thoughts of these political thinkers became the structure of the us constitution and today all civilized democracies have got this separation of power theory of a separate judiciary separate executive separate legislature by one french thinker similarly these are the uh, thoughts and ideas which have moved the world and your faculty in these 10 courses will tell the students look these are the important ideas and as you rightly put it you i like the expression use global historical and uh, future so you have got the global perspective you got history because if you don't i mean they say that history repeats itself and those who don't study history are condemned to commit the mistakes again and you got the future so what are the steps we take what is what are the what are the lessons history has taught us say for example socialism doesn't work beyond a point a market economy is the only driving force to achieve economic progress these are all thoughts you can have different points of view and i'm sure that this course of yours will be a crucible of ideas where people they'll be kind of a melting pot people come they will learn they will assimilate and they will develop their own thing and i think at the end of the day what your course will serve which will be the most important by product i think i could be wrong but i think it will perhaps teach these all of us the importance of thinking for ourselves and not just accepting what is given to us as face value someone still something take the there's something behind what somebody is telling you and let us go to the root of it and that's what your course will tell you it is rightly said that knowledge is power and not just knowledge the application of what you learn is power and i'll just conclude with a very important uh, article i read by peter drucker who all of us know as the management guru he has written a book called uh, memories of an officious bystander uh, it's a very unknown book and when drucker was a student he said that his teacher told him that never cease to be a lifelong student and i was surprised to learn i tried to follow it but i have not succeeded drucker took upon himself that uh, apart from his role as a management teacher and a writer and so on he decided to learn one new subject every 3 years for example he took the history of uh, israel jerusalem the palestinian movement as one subject then he took medieval europe as one subject he took the roman catholic church as one subject so every 3 years you would take up a subject and study it and i'll tell my audience very interesting to know that he one year took up the subject of japanese art japanese art and when he died outside japan peter drucker was one of the leading authorities on japanese art he just took up the subject and started studying it so this gives us an idea so suppose all of us join these courses people are join this course you may like to study these subjects and take up on yourself say economic development or technology you like it make a deep dive into it learn further so this is what this course will trigger this is what the course will activate it will be a catalyst to further thinking and i'm sure that those who join this course will have a fabulous fascinating enlightening and exhilarating time i wish the organizers all success and i hope that you conduct more such courses i think what you can do is even if it's a physical class it will be perhaps uh, better if you can record it on a video and if these modules can be kept ready for future suppose so many of us say a person in trichy or in madurai or in pune can't attend 
at least he can then have the privilege of hearing your outstanding faculty. I saw you got some very eminent people who are going to teach. Why can't a gentleman from Pune leverage this knowledge? And what what I like about any such course is when you call an expert, you basically are getting the advantage of 30, 40 years of experience. When a senior chartered accountant comes and speaks on policy, when an economic professor comes and speaks, you are getting the advantage in 75 minutes of leveraging his 30 years of experience and his knowledge. That is the beauty of these classes. Mr. Sudarshan, Mr. Arya, Venkat, all of you, hearty congratulations and wish you all the very best. And I and I hope that these courses become more and more popular. Thanks and a wonderful initiative you have taken. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so thank much, you, sir. I'm you, sir. I'm I'm only tempted to ask you to speak for another fifty five minutes, which will be our first class. But I understand that uh, you also are preoccupied with scheduled commitments as well as your session is lined up sometime as part of the course as well. Uh, what your address? Uh, truly did was to give a befitting curtain raiser to this program and also has reminded us to be not just widely read but well read with some of the examples that you have stated thank you so much for being here with us today uh, time to virtually welcome our next guest when both uh, uh, mr vikas and me were discussing that we had air marshal s vartaman last year uh we did not have any second thoughts in inviting dr shobha vartaman uh, just to encourage us for this initiative uh she is an mbbs from the madras medical college graduated in 1974 she has a da from royal college of surgeons of england in 1978 her experience includes neurology and anesthesia since 1978 she's worked in countries like india uk africa philippines and middle east she's been a board of trustees volunteer president in a variety of organizations so even when she speaks and if uh, any of you have observed her this ringside view to her uh, will be discernibly evident uh, finally she has gotten this award in 2012 uh, called the women of substance award i have no doubts in my mind that she truly is award or no she truly is a woman of substance and um, she is the mother of wing commander abhinandan vartaman and a proud wife of air marshal s vartaman shobama can we request you to speak please Ma'am, you're on mute, ma'am. Mute, I'm speaking. Ma'am, you're on mute. Sorry, <laughs> technologically challenged. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, and um, uh, my b uh, best wishes for a very happy Republic Day when our Constitution was formed seventy years ago. Um, and uh, Sudarshan, thank you very much for a very glowing um, uh, introduction of me. i i am uh, besides the relationships to uh, my husband and my son i do not know whether i deserve the rest of it actually uh, but all the same uh, it, it's really a privilege to share the virtual platform with somebody as uh, um, you know illustrious as uh, mr arvind datar and uh, i thank you so vikas arya and sudarshan for giving me this privilege to be part of this uh, inaugural event and uh, i'm glad we are all coming out of covid and uh, at the same time i'm very thankful to this little virus covid because it has given us a excellent opportunity to use the virtual media so very well in fact the number of uh, events meetings and uh, workshops that uh, i have attended personally as a student as well as a, a participant has been numerous i wouldn't have had this opportunity otherwise and it has also given us uh, opportunities to learn a lot and this is those stressful it has been a very uh, informative 
and uh, jnana prapti you know a lot of uh, knowledge has been gained in this past year so i really thank this little covid virus for uh, doing this for us um and uh, i i uh, after hearing the overview of this i really um, uh, am amazed at the effort of uh, the dav sectionum and uh, young thinkers forum for having come up with such a wonderful um, workshop uh, had it been uh, virtual i'm positive i'll be one of the students i am very tempted to be one of them actually because the topics are all so very uh, interesting and it's never too late to learn also and um, uh, the the thing is it's a very laudable effort uh, i wish the uh, workshop of both the workshops uh, a big success and uh, i'm sure those who attended will have a lot of takeaways both uh, i don't know where, whether they will be forming policies but at least they will know how to recognize a policy what to see in a policy what to expect in a policy and also what to demand of those who form the policies you see in most of our um, policies the policy makers make um, the policy uh, of what they think we want or what they think we should have but uh, i think most of the policies go by the way because it it is not catered to what we need what we want is different what we need is different and when it doesn't happen we are also very uh, you know relaxed and laid back because we never ask questions we don't demand basically because we do not know what the policy means and we do not know what it entails what it should deliver to us what service uh, what benefits i should get from this policy so as a public we remain ignorant except for we know that in we read in the papers one policy has been made and it is there and if i am the one who has who is the, the end user of that policy i'll find a lot of obstacles and um, you know in in utilizing that policy for my benefit so what is a pol uh, you know i have worked in ywca delhi where we were one of the seven sisters ngos who assisted the government in forming policies for women the domestic violence and uh, the uh, child rights and things like that and i've also been the user of uh, many policies uh, uh, where we i've been told what to do and uh, this was during my sabbatical year so i think i'm sort of um, qualified enough to talk about the public policy though i am no administrator i am not a bureaucrat but uh, being on the board of uh, a couple of international ngos i do feel the pressure of these policies and i have a certain idea about how it works um you see the in in this workshop i think the objective is not to make um experts of the participants to write down the policy but it is to create awareness of public policies public policy is what it is a policy made by the government for the public so so we should know whether the government is doing a good job of it and at the same time we should also try to give inputs to the government as to what we need uh, i mean it could always be what we want and what we need but the government should be like the anna pakshi which takes the milk out of the water and uh, and leave the water behind but at least they should have an information because many of uh, uh, the policy makers are sort of cocooned and uh, they do not have the public knowledge of what is happening and what is needed and um, in the formulation i feel most of the time when we think about public policy most important thing is the intent the intent is 
is this policy that I'm making, is it going to be uh, putting my nation first? Is it the policy that will help the nation get the services that I intend the public to get? Or is it going to help the nation progress? So th these intents have to be the primary moving force for forming any policies. Sometimes when I see a domestic violence policy, I guess I said, is it for people who are the, the women who is going in? Because I handled a lot of domestic violence when I was working in YWCA in Delhi. So the basic thing is to have the intent very clear and make the intent nation first and to benefit the uh, target population for whom the policy is being made. Invariably, these policies, I find say, many of them are made on theoretical um, academic uh, ideas and thoughts, wherein the human angle is not included in it. The most important thing about a public policy is the human being for whom it is intended for. Then the next problem is when you have made the policy, um, before I go to that, I think we should also have some innovations included in the policies. You know, we, we have the classicism, that is the policy which was made on the basis of rules and regulations or uh, or laws of uh, 1930s or the colonial period, it, it doesn't suit the uh, present day thing. Like you have a capsule on contemporary uh, public policy uh, section, but in that we could have some innovations in, included in that, like innovative thinking, innovative implementation, innovative tools to implement this and uh, you know, this needs um, a little bit of thinking out of the box. The other main problem I find in policies, public policies are in the decision-making. If, if the public have a problem today, the policy takes five to six years in the making, by which time the problem either has dissolved or it has, uh, diluted or it doesn't uh, matter anymore and these and also when because I think people are very scared of making any decisions very fast actually and also the other problem is not having a plan b I'm sure there are plan b's but we do not want to get out of the comfort of plan a to go on to plan b as the uh, dynamics of the situation requires. Let, let me give you an example. Vaccination for COVID has started. And when we started, we said uh, every day, a particular center can handle 300 and we are going to do that. Three days went by and we found that in many of the centers, only 50 came. Now we have a, a huge population waiting. And at this particular juncture, I would say that uh, change your thinking. Like if I have the next batch ready, that is the senior citizens, if I have 300 capacity and only 50 come, let me open out to those volunteers from the uh, elderly group come and get it. So I finish my 300 because very soon when people are convinced that everybody is getting the vaccination, I also will rush in and get it. The crowds are going to be very heavy and we could not, we cannot handle them. The other thing is um, when the second dose is to be started and the first doses also become crowded, then you are not going to have the capacity and then the policy of giving COVID vaccine to healthcare workers first and complete them is going to fail. So in this stage where the policy is there, it's a good policy, but when it is working like this, we should have the flexibility to quickly make a decision and make the policy work 
for for the population that we are planning to so this is one very important thing because here in this particular covid vaccination as a doctor i could tell you the time element is very crucial a stitch in time saves nine you see today we are in a pandemic to endemic stage the pandemic is coming down in india thankfully we've done very well and now it is just going to be endemic but we have a extra danger also of this mutant and the variants which are coming into this uh, this thing now the vaccines are prepared for the covid that we have had in the past year we do not know if they are going to work for the mutant and the variants that are going to come before those overtake us and and threaten us we should finish protecting these people who are already with this so the time element is important and this can only do um, uh, you know uh, happen when you hit the ground running and think while you are running and these kind of policies are successful only when they are implemented with alacrity and um, quick thinking and uh, so this is uh, and probably we don't have the courage of conviction which probably is another factor that uh, prevents us from taking uh, aggressive and um, you know uh, quick decisions but i'm sure the um, uh, powers above have all this in their mind but as a doctor uh, as i'm watching it one week has gone by with 50 50 people in one uh, this thing and the rest of us all waiting in the wings to get it so i mean it's not because of the selfishness of me but what i'm saying is let us get going we we lost our time with hiv aids and when we should learn lessons from the previous ones and then the more other important thing is when we make policies i do not know i am not a bureaucrat nor am i a policy maker i wonder if we write down the implementation methods the implementation tools and the time frames for it and we also start uh, fixing Uh, supervisors and evaluators at the time of forming the policy which uh, you know which will help us move along very fast like if a policy is made and it is going to be implemented thereafter trying to think about evaluation or supervision and waiting for a particular result to come like they say na time is a unidimensional linear uh, 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 element you can never put it back you can never go back to the time you can only go forward so we need to respect the time element and that is very important in making progressive policies and um, as i i i have uh, you know worked with some international ngos and uh, when we make our policies uh um, at the time of making the policy we go through these steps and i'm sure if when you explore the global uh, um, policy um, uh, section you would probably discover those things and it and it could be implemented in our things in our uh, scenario as well and then the most important thing in our country is supervision do we supervise our policy implementation of our policies that if we have the ownership for it then probably we will be impelled or will be inspired to do the supervision here we we are doing it for somebody else we don't have that ownership uh, that swikar that we are doing it for my community my people my nation and so i must see to it that it succeeds that is the um, like um, you know bharati uh, said in one of his tamil this thing i don't know how many of you understand tamil but i'm still going to say it uh, in his time a century ago there were only 30 crore people population in india so he said 
முப்பது கோடி ஜனங்களின் சங்க முழுமைக்கும் பொது உடைமை ஒப்பில்லாத சமுதாயம் உலகத்துக்கு ஒரு புதுமை ஹி ஹேட் கான்பிடன்ஸ் இன் இந்தியா தட் ஹி செட் தட் த என்டயர் தேர்ட்டி குரோர் பீப்புள் இஃப் தே திங்க் டுகெதர் அண்ட் தே அண்ட் தே பிகம் ஒன் யுனைட்டட் அண்ட் தே மேக் இட் அ பப்ளிக் ப்ராப்பர்ட்டி திஸ் கண்ட்ரி and this kind of a society this kind of a nation will be an example for the entire world actually i'm seeing us being an example for the world in many of our uh, public policies like atmanir uh, nirbhar bharat the swachh uh, abhiyan you see every time we go abroad we see we uh, it strikes you why can't my country be as clean as this but it never occurred to me that i should bring in a policy to clean up, clean up my uh, country but these are things that we can innovatively bring in as policies these are simple policies but we could do this actually and uh, so and uh, i'm also very happy about this uh, media thing because the today media is um, uh media uh, about a, a decade ago media thought it was a king maker today media is a confused uh, set of uh, people and uh, in the name of freedom of speech uh, they have lost their uh, um, the, the attributes that they should have like uh, you know they 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 uh, a media should be responsible i will talk in uh, uh, in reference to the internal security like the media does not think one bit about talking ill of our country in uh, 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 you know uh, like if balakot happens media thinks it is its responsibility to prove the government wrong right if you see united states if they do um, um, this thing of um, killing uh, osama bin laden except for reporting they do not do an analysis post mortem bring a, a, a unknown australian somewhere saying it didn't happen and uh, tear the government down this is the responsibility of a media which has to stand together to uh, you know to think of the nation actually this is my nation i have done this my government has done it i may have differences with my government but this is my responsibility because this has been done in india for india for the protection of my country so the media needs to be a little bit more responsible i know i i'm going on in the activist line but i will stop with that uh, i wish this um, event tremendous success and i hope you will do this workshops for many 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 more years to come with a lot of progress and which will benefit our society tremendously and my uh, congratulations to uh, dav sectionam and sudarshan for doing a wonderful job thank you very much uh, thank you so much uh, ama as always like i always tell you even off virtual calls when meeting you in person both air marshal you and wing commander you reaffirm how to keep india first and thank you so much for that it will certainly inspire uh, us to not only critically think but also do our bit towards uh, such uh, public policies thank you so much for taking out your time uh, the next uh, segment is i'm going to quickly show uh, the faculty uh, both our distinguished guests have touched upon uh the distinguished faculties that will be uh who will be arming this course in a way um the main course uh will have lieutenant general p r shankar who is a retired director general of artillery and professor of aerospace department i iit madras badri seshadri who is managing director synprosoft he is a social commentator analyst uh badri already also took key sessions last year uh, sham shaker who is the founder and ideator i thought another key investment and economic voice in tamil nadu arvind sir uh, we have requested him to come back and steer the reforms in judiciary session 
Um, Raj Charubal ji, who is the CEO of Chennai Smart City Limited, uh, we have requested him to steer on what it is to envision governance structure as far as Chennai City is concerned. Santosh Mishra, who is another able officer, which Tamil Nadu is incredibly, uh, IAS officer, which Tamil Nadu is incredibly proud to have. He's leading the Tamil Nadu e-governance agency so very well. Um, so he's a CEO and he's going to uh, take a session on artificial intelligence and Aadhaar. Uh, we have uh, a proud DAV parent in Irayanbu, who's IAS and uh, eminent writer. Uh, we have Nanda Kumarji, who al also took a session last year to steer the session on education. Uh, Dr. Sridhar Nagayan from Kaveri Hospitals, uh, again associated with the DAV family, has volunteered to come. And this is a very special slide because all three are DAV alumnus. So in a way, we are looking at people who have uh, uh, graduated from the DAV family, giving back to, uh, to the DAV family and the school through this program. So we have Mr. Venkat Vardhan, who is a senior advocate today. We have Meg Kalyan Sundaram, who's lived in China for almost a decade. Uh, he's going to steer the session on China. And we have Janani Sampath, who's a senior journalist and social commentator, also taking various sessions in these programs. So we're incredibly happy that they readily agreed to give back to the DAB family through this program. On media studies, we have some national faces because it is uh, a virtual uh, online course. We have Abhijit Mazumdar, who is a journalist, co-founder and editor-in-chief of a very Gen Next platform in Earshot.in. So you can hear news while you travel, while you are uh, not able to view it visually. Dr. Anand Ranganathan, who is a, a, a regular feature in TV these days, author, columnist and senior journalist. We have Advaita Kala, who is an author. She also wrote this famous Hindi movie, Kahani. So she's a screenwriter. So she's going to be steering one session. Uh, Janani Ma'am is going to steer uh, uh, another session. Uh, Malan, who's a senior journalist and commentator in Tamil Nadu circles, and Praful Ketkar is also steering uh, another session. So we do have some more names as part of this, but we will let that be for now. But this is just to give you an idea and also to inspire uh, all of you uh, while registrations are still open to be part of these um, educational initiatives. Any policy uh, for it to fructify needs strong political will and strong executive will as well. Similarly, for us, for this program to fructify, we need a strong educational will. So that is why we have uh, in Mr. Vikas Arya, a very dynamic young secretary of the governing board of DAV group of schools. And right uh, since the inception of the brainstorming for this program almost two years back, he was very keen that we begin and start. And slowly we are taking steady steps. We remain grateful to him. Uh, may I request uh, Vikasji to address the gathering as well as uh, share his thoughts. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Sudarshanji, for the very uh, overly kind introduction. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Arvind Dattar, sir, and uh, Shobha, ma'am, to uh, be there today. Uh, they very willingly accepted uh, our request to grace this occasion and share their uh, uh, invaluable thoughts. Uh, also, thanks to all the uh, participants uh, for joining us uh, today. Uh, the faculty members uh, who have uh, given their consent to uh, you know, take uh, various uh, uh, various sessions. Uh, just to once again highlight uh, the PPFP main course, the Public Policy Fellowship Program main course is an overview of multiple topics. That's going to be an on-site course. We debated a lot on this particular thing, whether we should keep everything online or everything off-site. And we said that, okay, let's do a kind of a mix and uh, nothing like being on site and, you know, kind of having a discussion with the faculty uh, that has a very, so though COVID has taught us multiple things, use of technology, et cetera, but still learning face-to-face, -face, I think is something which has a very different kind of an experience. So the PPFP main course will remain an on-site course. Uh, uh, and there's the same format we had last year, as Dushanji mentioned, we launched the course exactly on Jan 26, 2020. And so we follow the same pattern of having uh, 10 you know, sessions on 10 consecutive Sundays, two sessions every Sunday. 
a few one or two uh, you know two three sessions could be online as well over there uh, depending on faculty availability but otherwise most of the sessions are going to be offline uh, the media study course uh, we thought we will keep it online because online learning is also there to stay and uh, in which case we can also have audiences from uh, outside chennai and uh, sudarshan ji uh, through his rich network and contacts has been able to pull together i think a very very high quality list of faculty members i'm sure you would agree with that and uh, so overall just to highlight you know from what uh, uh, arvind sir mentioned uh, we tend to generalize a lot of policies uh, just reading newspapers on the go uh, here we get a structured uh, way in a, a very structured way in which we understand some of the key policies and uh, it was interesting to note that how uh, peter drucker you know like once in 3 years he picked up one topic and really went in depth i think that's a great way to you know diversify once uh, you know way to learn learning is a continuous lifelong process and uh, i think uh, this is something that can really trigger the learning process uh, 20 sessions and you know you never know you may really get interested in one of these topics and then deep dive into it indeed media studies the specific course is actually an attempt in that direction right so while even the overall ppfp main course also you have only one session media studies but then we deep dive into media studies and do an eight session you know full course wherein we understand media studies in far far you know greater detail similarly we will be launching a detailed course on defense as well uh, i think pretty much right after the media study course gets over we will be launching a defense or region studies so the multiple the interesting deep dives that uh, we will be uh, we will be conducting okay? so uh, and as shobha ma you know uh, she clarify and she kind of highlighted that a lot of practical issues with implementation of various policies is something which all of us do keep uh, cribbing about uh, in our drawing rooms uh, but here is a chance that you have to you know uh, straight ask questions to some of those uh, you know senior bureaucrats uh, uh, and understand as to what really goes on uh, you know behind the screens i remember last year we had uh, an interesting session on uh, uh, disaster management uh, by every senior rice officer who handled the tsunami crisis etc and could really understand as to how does the government really react when a disaster really strikes you know uh, obviously it's it's a surprise right and then how do things kind of you know get in place who is responsible for what so all these nitty gritties you know we get a good sense uh, you know from uh, courses uh, uh, like these and uh, yeah so i think what we thought was we'll also have a small q and a session now towards the end uh, if, if you have any queries on uh, you know sudarshan uh, ji should be do you want to take it look at that yeah these uh, uh, the questions are not intended for our speakers but this is just since it's also a inaugural come information session if any of you have any questions with respect to the course uh, the modalities of the course uh, please type it in uh, in the chat box uh, through either vikas ji or me will attempt to answer it if there are any questions we can spend a couple of minutes on that uh so if anyone would like to also unmute themselves and ask i think that's fine i have just okay. enabled the option now so sure. you can also unmute yourself and ask uh, or you can put in the chat either ways Uh, when and how should we pay the fees uh, uh once you fill up the pro forma um, our organizing team would uh, get in touch with you um basis we have certain minimum requirements um to fit it, fit you into the court and since uh, cohort and since it's also uh times of covid we want to have a compact group of 20 25 people only so once we receive your pro forma our organizing team will go through it and immediately be in touch with you and it's a pretty robust setup that we have uh in terms of payment etc that will be seamless once you are shortlisted to attend the course in case you wish to express interest and enroll for the programs uh, vikas ji has just circulated the registration form
Yeah, are both programs simultaneous? Yes, uh, we will begin the main course Feb 7th to April 11th, 10 consecutive Sundays. Media studies would be um, Feb 15 to 25th on weekdays in the evening, four weekdays each on those weeks. So it will not clash. You can enroll for both the programs. Registrations are open. You can uh, still register for the program. How will the assessment take place? Vikaji, would you like to throw light on that? So, uh, as far as assessment is concerned, so we typically uh, what we do is we request for uh, uh, so that so so assessments for the. So there is this on-site program and the virtual program. So let me cover the on-site program first. So in which case, typically like the last cohort that we had uh, you know, in 2020, we uh, had, uh, so we broke this, uh, the 20 sessions into two broad uh, buckets, like semesters is what we call, which is one to 10 and then 11 to 20 sessions, 20th session. Uh, after the 10th session, we had a, a, a small quiz uh, or a MCQ type of, uh, you know, uh, assessment, uh, uh, you know, for the for the entire cohort, and similarly at the uh, you know end of the second semester, as how, what we may loosely call, we once again have the written uh, the written uh, uh, quiz as well. In addition, at the both at the end of the first semester and the second semester, we uh, request the participants to write an essay on any one of the topics that was covered, you know, in these ten sessions, wherein they can summarize, you know, or uh, their their thoughts on uh, that particular topic based on what the speaker mentioned or they can go beyond it they can also do some secondary research and you know uh, further add their you know a few points to it so so it's it's a mix of mcqs plus uh, you know plus uh, the uh, essay submission okay. uh, with regard to the media study course uh, i guess it'll be more of the essay submission hello that's the that's the sense that we have we may do a, we may do some slight tweakings here and there for this cohort but that's the that's a broader framework. Thank you, sir. But one addendum only on submitting your assessments, you are eligible for the certificate. Yeah, that's it. So those who, yeah, if you don't, so you can still attend the course if you don't want to kind of, you know, uh, go in for the assessment, that's also absolutely fine. But just that we don't issue a certificate in, in, in that case. Thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you, sir. When is the last date for registration, Vikaji? Uh, so it's nothing specific in the small of first come first serve and, you know, but for the on-site program, we will be limiting the number of participants, uh, given the COVID norms, uh, for the on-site for the, for the virtual program, you know, it's fine. So I think the registrations can be even pretty much till the end, uh, the on-site program, once we have the, you know, the, the number of participants, we will kind of, you know, stop it out there. Unless uh, there are any other key questions. Uh, I think the form, if you see, is also very self-explanatory. Um, our team is on standby to answer any other questions that you may have. On site, uh, as assured, the governing body as well as the school authorities are taking utmost uh, steps to ensure that we have a seamless, uh, clean, uh, sanitized experience for both the faculty as well as the cohort by maintaining both physical distancing as well as necessary guidelines.
okay so we will wind up there on this fascinating for this fascinating virtual inaugural information session um thank you to our distinguished speakers thank you to mr vikas arya all the members of the governing board staff who are enabling this uh program as well as those who are joining us um uh, on facebook as well as here we hope you will join us for this cohort in the event of we not able to accommodate you for this cohort we will be in touch with you as our team is keeping track of all registrations for this program thank you so much please stay safe take care and once again a very happy republic day to all of you thank you thank you very much namaste ஒன்னு வயசு என்ன இது ஏன் படிக்கிறது